let's begin. We want to talk about spiritual warfare, right? So there are several stories, okay, in the Old Testament. Is they peel back, okay, and begin to look into the invisible realm, right? One of the things they notice, like in Second Kings chapter six, right, it talks about the Lord opened the eyes of Elisha the servant, and he began to see the army of God. Right? The servant was completely oblivious, unaware. As he opened the window, he saw the Syrian army and it gripped him. But he was totally unaware that in the invisible realm, there was another army. There was another mighty force that was there. And then we see in the book of Daniel again, as, as the invisible realm is beginning to open up, Daniel begins to encounter an angel standing before him. You know, the others that are, they, they see an angel, but terror begins to fall on them. You know, as far as Daniel is concerned, he's having this conversation with this supernatural being. But here, there is a, a two-part reaction. You know, isn't that true today? Why? Because ironically today, most Christians are oblivious of the spiritual realm. Most Christians have no clue about this realm. There is a blindness okay, in the eyes of the people as far as spiritual warfare is concerned. Because most people are involved in an emotional war, they are involved in a psychological war, but they do not realize bigger than all that is a spiritual war that is going on, right? Someone said, the best defense is a strong offense, right? Educating ourselves about the spiritual realm is the half the fight and God gives us everything else we need to be victorious in the other half, right? So we must educate ourselves. You know, most Christians, you know, do not educate themselves. The only education they get is when they go to a church on Sunday morning and begin to listen to a sermon. But I believe that most of us need to educate ourselves, especially at this hour. Look at what Hosea says. Hosea says, my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge and they reject knowledge. Right? They reject knowledge. You know, could you imagine? You know, I know that most people are, you know, so fanatic over their handphone. You know, they look at their handphone like 200 times a day. Every few seconds, look at the handphone. Imagine if we flip that. If they look at the Bible that many times. Okay? If they look at the Bible that many times, imagine what will happen to their lives. I think it will be powerful. If they look at the Bible 200 times a single day, I tell you their lives will be transformed, right? Because why? It's life-giving. The Word of God is life-giving, right? What does your handphone do? It does nothing. It only creates envy and jealousy when you see somebody sitting at a beach and drinking, you know, a, a drink under the umbrella, right? That's all it does. It does nothing, right? It's a good communication tool, but I believe it's important for us to focus on God's Word, right? Today's context, I want to talk about this man called Job. Okay, so let's look at his story. He says there was a man in the land of Uzzah, whose name was Job, and he was a blameless and upright man, one who feared God and shunned evil, right? All the things that he talks about this man, right? And then he says, was for his sons would go out and feast, right? At an appointed day, he would, in, you know, and they would drink and they would basically party. Right? So what would Job do? Interesting, what this is what Job does. Job would send, sanctify them. He would rise up early in the morning, burn offerings. He would say, God, you know, my sons have sinned against you or curse the Lord in their hearts. You know, Job would offer penitence. He, he was a, a very good man. He was a very good father. Right? But of course, his kids were partying, having a good time. Verse 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered 
my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and shuns evil. Okay, what a beautiful description, right? So let's do some background here. Who are the sons of God? Right, in the, in the Hebrew, the sons means Ben and God here is Elohim. This is speaking about angelic beings, right? So Satan himself was given access as the angels came to God's presence, okay? Some theologians believe that the book of Job was written, you know, while the first five books were written because it predates all the other books. So we do not understand the entire scenario, but all we can understand from reading scripture is that at this season, whatever, whenever it was, that these angelic beings and even Satan himself had access before God, right? So, and here, it's very interesting, right? As this was going on in the back of the sea, Job had no clue. Okay, Job had no clue that in the spiritual realm, there was a discussion going on about him. And there are events that are going to happen in the background that is going to completely change his life. It's going to change his life forever. But he had no clue what was going on back there. Okay, this is very important. If you go and understand spiritual warfare, you need to understand the background of this story. Because the background of this story sets the stage how you and I should behave when it comes to spiritual warfare. Okay, my interest is not just to talk to about the demonic aspect of that, but my interest is to reveal to you today God's role in the entire spiritual warfare, right? So there is a challenge here in the spiritual world, right? Because God tells Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Blameless man, upright man. What's God doing? God's bragging about him, right? God's a good father. He brags about you all the time. He brags about you and me all the time. Why? Because he's a good father. He brags about his kids, right? So the spiritual challenge was what? Because of his faith and devotion, okay? Not because of his sin. Yet, you know, he's not perfect, but it was not because of his sin. It was because of his devotion. Interesting, right? Confrontation with the enemy comes when you get closer to God. Not when you are lazy. The devil doesn't bother you, right? You are lazy, sleepy, you don't care about God. The devil doesn't bother you. The devil says, you know what? Laziness will take care of him. Apathy will take care of him. Why do I need to send an angel to bother him? Right? You see, the devil is only interested in you when you get on fire for God. That's when all trouble comes. You know, I heard Christian says, my life has no trouble. Probably has no trouble because you do nothing. You see, you do nothing to influence the spiritual realm. Right? You do nothing to challenge the spiritual realm. So guess what? Nothing happens. Just case sera, sera. Day after day, week after week, nothing happens. Nothing. Why? Because there's no challenge. Remember the challenge did not come because he sinned, but because he was blameless, right? Psalms 40, 34, 19 says this, Many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront the righteous. What is that? It confronts the righteous, but the Lord rescues him from all of them. Right? You see, if you are a person who pursues God, who loves God, you don't have to worry about the trouble you're facing today. You don't have to worry about the calamity you're facing today. Why? Because God will come through for you. That's the promise. It says he will rescue you. So verse 9, Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? Look at that, what he says, right? Have you not made a hedge around him? He has on every side, around his household, you have blessed the works of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you. Look at that. Satan is revealing something. That there is a supernatural force field 
around Job, around his family, around his possession that Satan could not touch Job. So take Satan accepts the challenge from God. He says, okay, take your hand off. Remove this force field and let me show you what, how much he really trusts you, right? So, so what's that? He said, look at that again. You have made a hedge around his household, okay? On every side. What is a hedge? It's a spiritual fence. It's a wall of restraint, right? There was a force field around Job. Nothing could penetrate. Nothing could go through. Can you imagine living like that? Wow. It was such a security around him. Look at that. So this is the picture of what it probably looked like. The force field, right? And that force field was so huge, right? It covered his family. He covered his property. Remember, Job had thousands of livestock. He said 7,000, you know, sheep. He couldn't put it in a room. He couldn't put it in a barn. It was 7,000. So that force field covered everything that belonged to Job. Is that powerful? Everything that belonged to Job was covered by that force field. Okay? So powerful. Right? So how does Satan, right? How does Satan know this? Because he's been trying to penetrate. He's been trying to get in. He could not get in. Satan recognizes, man, why I can't touch this guy? Because there's a force field around him. There is a demarcation line that God has drawn around this guy that I cannot touch him. Right? And this, you know, this demarcation line okay, is around you and I as believers too, right? So in order to understand spiritual warfare, we must understand this force field that is around Job, right? Okay, let's turn, look at that again. He says, have you not made the hedge around him? So who made this force field, right? Who made this force field? God did, not Job. Not Satan. God did. God put this force field, right? As long as it belonged to Job, as long as that thing was marked as it belonged to Job, guess what? Satan couldn't touch. Nothing could touch because of that force field, right? You see, we have a force field. It mentions in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12. You see, our force field is even more powerful than what Job had. Because what Job had was Old Testament. What we have is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Read the scripture. Ephesians 1 12. So you and I, okay, we who were the first hope in Jesus Christ, who exist to the praise of his glory in him, you also who are who heard of the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, believed in him, was stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Right? Looks at look at that. The one promised by Christ, okay, as owned and protected by God. Look at that. You and I are protected by God. Okay, so let's look further about this false field, right? It, Okay, this is very important, right? Okay, that we must understand this force field, right? So we have a free choice, okay? And we are open, we can open wrong doors, right? You can have a force field, but you can open the wrong doors. Like for example, Genesis 4, 7 talks about, right? The guy called Cain, right? What is God telling him? I love the translation in the, in the message Bible. It says, why this tantrum, right? Tantrum. Why are you sulking? If you do well, wouldn't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is lying, waiting for you, ready to pounce. It's up to get you. It's got, you've got to master it. 
Look at what God tells him. Sin is waiting at the door. If you open the door, it's going to jump in. If you don't rule over it, it's going to rule over you. Right? So here, what happened to Cain? I bet he had the force field around him, but he violated it. You see, once he violated it, guess what happened to him? Right? You know the story. So let's go a little bit further. Okay, I got a lot of ground to cover. Right? This force field is so powerful that even though we have our own free will, ultimately, still God has control and the delineation of how it works. That means God decides how big that force field is. You see, He decides how wide it covers. Right? It could cover you. It could go a little bit further. God decides. Right? The, the hitch over Job was placed by the Almighty God. God made this force field around him. You see, God decides where the line of the force field occurs. God decides the demarcation line. That means where it ends. He decides where it ends. Right? Job was not a perfect man. He had blind spots. Remember, he yielded. To thoughts and feelings, right and wrong, but God makes the decision. See, God makes the decision, right? Where that line was, it wasn't. It wasn't up to Job. It was up to God, right? God made the decision on a, on a, whether it's going to be a narrow band or a wide band, right? God is the one. Okay, when Satan, right, right, only when God made it narrow. Okay, only when Satan. Right? Wanted okay, to prove to God that Job okay, was only upright, was only righteous because God blessed him. Now you take the blessing, right? Like some people, you know, once the blessing is gone, man, they backslide. You walk away from God. Right? So here Satan is saying, take the blessing away. See if he, you know, in today's context, see if he, she still comes to church. Take the blessing away. If, see if he or she still pays time. Take the blessing away. And see if he or she is still obedient to the calling over their lives. Right? So that was what, that's what Satan was doing here. Right? Okay? So, Job had a huge, right, force field. Huge. It covered all his livestock. Right? But now, it got reduced. The Job alone, he didn't even cover his children. It got reduced. Look at that. Right? It got reduced. It became smaller. Who created this force field? Who decided on the size of this force field? It was God. In spite of his weakness, in spite of his fears, the hedge of protection was around him his servants and his livestock still remain right god gives us grace as long as it's not sin unto death is that true sometimes we disobey disobey we are not faithful right we violate certain things that we committed to but you know the grace of god is still there still there he's still faithful when we are not faithful he's still good when we are not good he's still kind when we are not kind is that amazing that's the wonderful god that we serve what changed the force field from surrounding everything he owned only to himself what shrunk that force field it was god god decided it's time to shrink that force field. It's time to shrink that covering over him. It was why decided. Look at verse chapter 2. And again the sons of God presented themselves. Satan came again. And Satan answered and said, From going to and fro the earth, walking back and forth. Right? What happened? You see, he, he reduced... Job lost everything, right? Lost his family, lost all his children. But Job was still upright. Job did not curse God. Isn't that amazing? Amazing, right? 
did it. He lost everything. But he still did not forsake God. So Satan comes back. He comes back and he says, you know what? Verse 3, he says, Lord, have, you know, so God said, have you considered my servant? Look at that. God saying again, blameless, upright, one who fears me and shuns evil, a man of integrity, right? And this is what God says about Job. He says, you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause. Get that. God is saying, there is no cause in Job why I should do this to him. Look at that. Isn't that powerful? What a man. What a man of God. Right? Imagine he lost everything. He still holds fast to his integrity. God said, you incite me against him to destroy him without a cause. There is no reason Right? There is no reason for that hedge that protects Job to reduce. No reason. The hedge surrounded him. Job still loved God. But look at it. That hedge that surrounds him gets reduced a second time. Two times. It gets reduced. I like this quotation. It came up in my mind as I was preparing. You will only know the weakness of a man. You, okay? You will only know the weakness of a man, right? Not through his successes. But you will know the integrity and the character of a man, right? Through his trials. It's trials. When you go through trials, it reveals who we are. It reveals who we are. So Satan tells God, verse 4, he says, Lord, skin for skin, all that this man has, he will give for his life. Now stretch out your hand now, touch his bones and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to the face. And the Lord said to Satan, look at that, another challenge. Satan is challenging God again. You see, you had a force field around him. He was blessed. He was having a great time. That's why he walked with you. Take out that force field. Remove that protection and see how he behaves. Right? So first time, guess what? Job didn't change. Job was the same man. He lost his family. He lost his, you know, all his livestock. He lost his servant. He lost his property. But Job did not change. He did not change. He was still a man of integrity. But the question we're talking about was that the force field was reduced. So Satan comes a second time and he says, you know what? Now let's go closer. Forget about Jesse's property. Now let's touch his body. Let's touch skin for skin. Right? Reduce this. Reduce him. Right? The only thing that Lord, you can still preserve is his life, his spirit, and his, right? and his spirit. Everything else, right? So boils, right? So this is what Job ends up. He starts off, right, with a man with plenty of land, plenty of, you know, rich landowner. And now he's sitting there with a man with boils. His whole family is gone. Look at that, right? So that force field that was around him. Remember how big it was? It was so huge that it covered the entire land. Now, if that force field is reduced, 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 okay? It only covers his life. Only his breath. He's just breathing. Only breathing. Only breathing. Right? Question, who reduced that force field? Is it the devil? Absolutely no. It's not the devil who reduced that force field. The devil has no power to reduce that force field of God. The 
that surrounds Job. Job had this tremendous covering of God that surrounded him like a wall of fire. Remember what scripture says, right? The glory within and the fire around. So he had this huge glory that surrounded him at the Job chapter 1. He refused to curse God. He refused to give up. He refused to quit. And God says, what an integrous man. You know, most Christians today will give up God if they lose their job. If they lose their family. If they lose their luxury, they will give up God in a single heartbeat. But look at this man. That's why God is so proud of him. He says, look at my servant Job. Look at him. He's lost everything. But yet he will not curse me. Yet he will not be grumbling in his heart. He would not be murmuring in his heart. Why? Because he really loves me. Right? So this false field was reduced. Reduced. Some people say, is this scriptural? You're talking about this false field that surrounds believers. Is this scriptural? Let's look at the New Testament to get a context here. Luke chapter 22 verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. That when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Look at that. Okay. Satan, when wanted to test Peter, he had to go to Jesus and ask for permission. You know why? Why did Satan have to go to Jesus and ask for permission? You know why? Because the false fear that surrounded Jesus was extended to his disciples. See that? New Testament. The first feel that surrounded Jesus was extended to his disciples. Satan could not get near the disciples without Jesus' permission. Okay, question. Why did Jesus give permission? He gave permission to Satan because when Jesus was praying about this situation, he knew Peter would fail, learn a lesson, he would come back. See what I'm saying? Pete, Jesus knew the end. So he said, devil, go ahead. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. I already know the end. Peter will come back. You see? So how powerful in the New Testament. Let's go on. So much material to cover, right? It is God who has redrawn this false field, right? It is not, okay? It is not Job, it wasn't Satan, it is God, right? So we see in the New Testament, God has redrawn that false field. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus says, all authority is given, over, right? All authority and power, right? Right? Over everything is given to Jesus, right? And now through Jesus' delegated authority, the church has the power. Come on. Okay, the church. That's why when you are a church, you are a stronger voice than you are just an individual. Right? The church, right? The, it says what? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. See? It says that. So that force field from Jesus now has been extended, right? To the church, right? So Satan has no foothold on this earth. Satan has no authority over the church of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is what? Resist the devil. And he will flee from us. Right? He will flee from us. Right? So when, when will Satan have an authority over the church? When will he? Let's look at that. Right? The book of Daniel, verse 20, chapter 7, verse 25 says, He will defy 
the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred feasts and laws. He will, they will be get placed under his control for times, times, and half a time. Okay? During the tribulation period, guess what happens? Right? The laborers here it's speaking about will go through the tribulation, right? 1260 to 300 and a half years. The book of Revelation chapter 12 talks about this. Guess what happens? We hand it over to Satan. Are you with me? That's a time where he will rule and cause havoc upon the earth, right? This is just a sight. No, but let's come back to what we are talking about here. The question is, why would God reduce that force field? Think about that. Job had such a nice force field. It was huge. Covered all his property, covered his servants, covered his children, covered his family. Everything was covered. Right? So wonderful. It's like living in paradise. <laughs> Why? Why would God change that? Right? Right? If you had a false feel like Job, no evil will come near you. You will never be tempted. You will never be tested. You will never have a trial. Why would God change that? Right? Why? You see, if you had a false feel like that, you see, what will happen is that you will never be tested. You will never be proven if you really love God. See what I'm saying? You never be proven. Why? Because everything is there. It's like living in paradise. God had to reduce it so that you will receive your reward based on meritocracy. What is meritocracy? That means your own effort and hard work. You see the rewards that you will receive in heaven on your crown, the life you will have on eternity, listen, is because of how you use the giftings, the talents, and the ability of God to extend His kingdom, His rulership on the earth. You see, each one has different type of test, different type of temptation, different type of trial, which is designed based on your gifting, your calling and strength that he has placed on the inside of you. You see, when you measure in God's sight, every human being is given a fair chance. Everyone is given a fair chance. You see, some people say, oh, I do not even want to know God. Some people play a religious game. They only get to know God on Sunday morning, right? But then there are those, right? Look at this. God's reward is based on what? Not Sunday Christian. It's based on two things. Faithfulness and works. Okay? Salvation is free. It's free. You get saved because of what Jesus did. Nothing. You can add nothing. I can add nothing. Jesus did. Salvation is free. And listen. Reward is not free. If reward is free, then it is not reward. Come on, church. If reward is free, it is not reward. Right? Right? Crown of glory is not free. Let's look at some scripture to establish this. Right? Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search to and through the earth. Why? Looking for what? Those that are loyal towards Him. What's loyal? Faithful towards Him. Right? Jesus talks about in Matthew 25 verse 21. Right? The Lord says, Well done. Good and what? Faithful servant. You had few things. But I now make you ruler of many. Why? Because I gave you few gifts. Few ability. But you took that few things and expanded it. 
gain up for yourself. You expanded it. What did the servant do? He expanded it for his master. See, Jesus is not coming back so that you will be driving a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce or, or live in a, in a, in a, in a six-story building. No, he's coming back for his, what you have done with his investment. What you have done with the gifting, the talent he placed on the inside of you. He's coming back for that. Proverbs says what? Right? A faithful man will abound with many blessings. Proverbs 28, 20. So let's look now at, right? Let's look at, look at faithfulness. Let's look at works now. Paul talks about it in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work. What sort it is? If anyone's work which is built, on it endures, he will receive a reward. Look at that. What kind of work have you built? Have you built your kingdom or have you built Christ's kingdom? Have you extended your name or have you extended his name? Right? If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Look at that. Right? He will be saved, but his works will be lost. Right? He will go into heaven, but all that he did in his lifetime had no benefit for heaven. No benefit for heaven. Makes a sting, right? In seven days in a week, how much benefit have I brought heaven? And how much benefit have I brought myself? How much benefit? All that I do in the seven days, how much of it goes to the glory of God? How much of it? How much of it do I separate? It's only me, myself, and I. Same person. Right? When someone is rewarded in heaven above, it is because of their works. Right? Salvation is based on grace. What Jesus did. Rewards are based on works. What we have finished doing through God and for God. What you do through God, for God. This is what he's looking for. So question, why did God reduce that force field? The force field was reduced so that the person can come face to face with the greatest fear in his life, the greatest obstacle in his life, the greatest challenge in his life and pass it with flying colors. This is God's will. That every time you are confronted, every time you face adversity, every time you face difficulty, you cling on to Jesus, your rock and your fortress. And you pass one test after another test after another test. And you fulfill God's will. You see, when you don't pass the test, you know what will happen? It will get repeated. It will get repeated. You know one thing about heaven? You can't skip grade. Okay? There's no skipping. If there's a lesson you needed to, be, needed to learn it, you did not learn it, God will make sure you learn it. That lesson will be repeated until it's time you pass. And then you go on. That's why many people, you know, some people say, you know, I feel like I'm stuck in the Lord. You know why? Because you never pass. I feel like I'm stuck between two places. Surrender. Obey. Pass the exam. Then the door will open. Some people say, oh, the door is not opening. Listen, you know, if you walk close with God, you walk faithful with God, you know what will happen, right? Too many doors will open. I've been asking the Lord. I said, Lord, close some doors. Too many doors. Why? Because God opens doors. He's a faithful God. He's a good God. Amen. So what happens when
when someone feels a test, gets repeated until you pass. Right? Suppose, you know, the lesson was supposed to be learned in two years. They never learn what happens. It takes ten years for them to learn that lesson because God wants to reward you. He wants to reward you. He wants you to finish the race. So when Job passed the test, what happens? Right? He prayed for his three friends. Right? Job understood what God was doing. Job 42 verse 12 says, And the Lord blessed the later days of Job more than the beginning. Everything doubled. You know what happened? That force field became double in size. Because he passed the test. He passed the test. Right? James 1.12 says, Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been proven, he will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised him. When God does give you the reward, he wants to ensure that those that receive are qualified to receive it by the works they have brought forth. Right? What did Jesus say? He said, by your fruits. They will know your fruits is not just character. Listen, it's what being displayed around you, what you have produced, right? Amen. So when Job passed the test, right, it expanded. And then what do we see, right? Here we are coming to a close. Let's look at the life of Jesus to understand this force field again. Right? Mark chapter 1 verse 12. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. See, Jesus was born with that spiritual covering. He was born with that force field around him, right? But the minute he was baptized, that force field was reduced. And he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You see, Satan could not come near Jesus until that force field was reduced. Reduce. Right? When that force field was reduced, Satan came close and the angel stepped aside. The father had to do that so that Jesus had to pay the same price before he is rewarded. See? If Jesus had to pay the price, why do we think that we can go to heaven without paying a price, without suffering, without going through trials, without going through difficulty? Why do we think that? See, God is the one that allows these things. He was tormented, tested for 40 days and 40 nights. You see, what he had was a crash course. You and I had what Jesus had, we will be finished. Okay? He handled it 40 days. What he did in 40 days, it takes us a lifetime to do. We don't have that capacity to handle that level of testing and trial what Jesus went through. 40 days. Some people can't handle one day fasting. They can't handle six days. Then of six days they are writing down. When I finish my fast fall, I'm going to eat all this. You can't. You can't. 40 days, Jesus passed the test with what? Flying colors. How do we know this? Because he came out of the wilderness with the power of the Spirit. There was a greater presence. He was tempted in every way, but the Bible says he did not sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you such as is common to men, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. And now look at what he says. He will also make a way of escape. This is so powerful. I don't have time to get into that. But the word temptation, you know, in the Greek, it doesn't explain it in the English. But in the Greek, this is what it says. It says that when God allows a temptation, together with the temptation, he provides a way of escape. Embedded in the temptation is the way of escape. Embedded in the trial is an exit point. Embedded in that difficult season is an exit point. 
it provides a way out. You can run out, okay? You can run from temptation, you can bear it, and you can get through. Hallelujah, are you still with me? God prepares the test and trials at the same time, exit and reward. Look at that. Why is God providing the exit? Because after the exit comes the reward, comes the blessing. That's right. See a lot of people pray, Lord, I want to be used to touch United States, to touch Florida, to touch Singapore. You see, every time you ask God for something, together with your request is a temptation, a trial, testing, and a reward. The bigger of the thing you ask for, bigger the trial. Bigger the testing. Guess what? Bigger the reward. See what I'm saying? Right? Bigger the reward. So if you ask for a nation, guess what? You're going to have a national, nation level trial. You're going to have testing like no one have ever seen. Why? Because your reward is national. Right? What you win at local and what you win at national, what you win at regional, what you win at global is all different. That's why it says in the book of Corinthians, when we get to heaven, some will be like the star, some will be like the moon, but some will be like the sun. The glory will be different. Why? Because the suffering was different. You know, if I was Paul, if I was Paul and some guy only went to church on Sunday, six next to Paul in heaven, I will be absolutely disappointed. Why? Because Paul went through hell to get to heaven. He went through prison to get to heaven. You know, or anyone else, any one of the giants of God. See? Suffering, trial, reward. God reduced the force field. Why? He reduced it so that he can prove that you and I deserve a reward. That you and I are worthy of receiving a reward in heaven. You see, if we are unwilling. Many people are unwilling. They think Christian life is a love book. I've got news for you. It's a battleship. Okay? The deeper you want to go in God, the tougher your journey will be. The higher you want to go in God, the wider your journey will be. Right? Is God fair? When God places his force field around you, he chooses the time, the place to reduce the force field so that you can enter a season of trial, testing that you can receive the reward. He will not allow you to take the test unless you are able. Never go beyond your ability. He prepares the test. He prepares the exit plan and the reward. Doesn't matter how many times you fail. Pick yourself up. Why? Because God has provided a way out. God has provided an exit plan. Okay? His goal is not the exit plan. His goal is to put on you a crown of glory for your willingness not to give up on church. You know, today one of the saddest things that's going on because of this epidemic, Christians have become a bit apathetic. They become lazy. Many don't want to go back to church. Many do not want to pray. Many do not want to pursue God anymore. Now they have come up with a new form of Christianity. Apathy will cause you to lose everything. Complacency will cause you to lose everything. Church, we must come to that place and recognize, ah, what are we doing right now? What are you doing right now? How is your journey like right now? What are you doing? You know, as I was going through my own season. There were many promises that God had made in my life before I went through this latest season, latest episode in my life. 
I began to re-examine and I thought, you know, all that. I have served God. I walked with God, you know, over 30 years. Walk with God. Many nations, many places. I've been, I lived overseas over 15, 17 years. I've lived overseas right now. Well, in, more than a third of my life I've lived overseas. But in this new season, as I begin to examine, I said, Lord, what else do you want me to do for you? It's not what I want to do for myself. I've already done things for myself. Because why we are at a, a new season, a new juncture. Because, see, your job's not going to bring a reward. Your wealth is not going to bring a reward. It's only your investment in God that's going to bring a reward. See, some of you say, I don't have a trial. Yeah, because you're not living for God. I don't have a testing. Yes, because you're not pursuing Him wholeheartedly. You are just living for yourself. You see, if you're living for Him, if your goal is to get up in the morning, go to the workplace so that you can be a witness for Him, so that you can be a testimony for Him, so that you can be a soul winner for Him, I tell you, there will be a testing. There will be a trial. There will be temptation. Why? Because your agenda is Him and His glory and His purpose. And God will reduce that phosphor so that you can go from glory to glory. The Bible says that in the last days many will fall away. Church, it is happening right now. Many will walk away from God. It is happening right now. I pray that you will strengthen yourself. You will undergird yourself. And that you will begin to rise up with a new commitment, with a new assignment, with a new agenda to pursue God wholeheartedly. Because we are living in the crux of the end times. We are living in the decade where we can see the coming of Jesus so close like never before. So I encourage you, I challenge you, get closer to God. Get closer to his purpose. Get closer to his assignment. Be faithful with doing the works of God. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus, strengthen us with a resolve in our hearts that you are preeminent. You are the most important thing. Lord, not even our life matters to us, but your calling, your purpose, your assignment matters to us, Father God. So Lord, we ask you once again, come and affirm that assignment, that plan, that purpose once again over our lives so that we will finish that we receive from the Lord Jesus. And Lord, let your favor, 
your blessing, your glory cover each and every one. God bless you. God keep you. And I pray that you would have an amazing week.